We are very happy to have you guys here. Once again, we, 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 we promised a warm welcome, and here's a warm welcome. We actually rehearsed for this. Everybody was here very, very early to get a seat in this uh, lecture hall. We could have had like five of those lecture halls uh, filled with students. Unfortunately, this is only one, but anyway, those people are very happy to see you. And I hope that you have to see them too. The idea is <laughs> that we're going to have a presentation of uh, Professor Shell's experiment, because this is not just a space, it's not just any other space mission to, uh, to the ISS, but it's a space mission that has one of our Experiments on board. Es hat ein Experiment von Herrn Schell an Bord, wo es um äh, dunkle Materie geht, um äh, Teile, die es eigentlich da draußen nicht geben sollte. Ich habe eben gehört bei der Pressekonferenz, eigentlich gibt es da nur Licht, aber offensichtlich gibt es da mehr als Licht. Und um das herauszufinden, haben die einen Wahnsinns Apparillo gebaut. Und den haben die Jungs hier mitgenommen. Und er funktionierte. Und das wird uns Herr Schell gleich noch alles erklären, wenn die Technik funktioniert, auch mit Bildern, richtig? Okay, und dann kann es losgehen. Und dann haben wir gleich äh, ein paar Eindrücke, wie das da ist.
Und es geht weiter mit dem Schädel. Und der redet jetzt leicht zu ihm, da braucht man keine große Technik. Nur einen guten, guten Professor. Der steht da vor ihm. Und fängt gleich an zu reden. All right. You see, at this university, only the Chancellor is allowed to talk. <laughs> but uh, I hope that we will be able to start the presentation. Um, okay, now we got it. Great. So, you have seen in this video basically the construction of the instrument. There's a picture of the ISS. Here is the AMS instrument, as you see on the scale, it's a macroscopic object. Um, what it's doing there, we physicists ask stupid questions. Why is the universe there? Why are we there? What needs to happen that matter is created in this universe? And to these stupid questions, I mean, these are fundamental questions which mankind is asking since centuries, um, we are trying to find answers. And our problem is that the physics, actually the physics that we teach you, is not giving answers to this. So if we are trying to understand why there is a universe, and why there is matter in the universe, we have the problem that, um, according to our theory, there should be no matter in the universe. And obviously you would complain this is completely wrong, because we are there, and you are right. Um, so we need measurements, we need new measurements, and the task of AMS is to measure cosmic rays, so this is a satellite experiment, uh, AMS is very similar and is measuring cosmic rays and we try to understand how this universe was formed, why there are galaxies and um, if there are galaxies then we have the conditions that um, there could be humans, intelligent life, we, we call ourselves intelligent life. Um, now AMS, um, if you ask what is AMS, AMS um, the, one of the authors of Scientific American in May 12, 2011 called it the Space Station Crown Jewel. It's the largest scientific instrument on the International Space Station. Um, it's a particle physics detector, a complex uh, instrument. So I will, don't worry, I will not try to explain to you how it works in detail. Yeah? I will try to give you an impression why we are doing it and why it's fascinating to do it. But uh, we can measure cosmic rays with a precision which is 1,000 to 10,000 times better than any instrument which tried it before. So we have the chance to discover something new, completely new. Um, the idea is from Professor Samuel Ting from MIT for this experiment. He's a Nobel Prize winner um, in the 70s. He's a particle physicist. And uh, he had a simple idea. What we know about the cosmos, about the universe, is from neutral cosmic rays. That's photons, which we use for astronomy. There's neutrinos, which we can observe on Earth. But if we want to um, measure charged cosmic rays, we have to go to space. Because Earth's atmosphere protects us from it. And to give you an idea, what we have as cosmic rays coming in, there are protons, antiprotons, electrons, positrons, helium, beryllium, carbon, iron, these are all things that we can measure. And what we hope to find is, for example, one anti-helium nuclei in cosmic rays, because it would prove that antimatter exists after the Big Bang in the cosmos. And uh, these particles enter the atmosphere, they produce a shower, a cascade, and this cascade is going down, and we can see it, and we have here a typical particle detector standing over there, which was constructed also in the Institute, it's a basic technology for the follow-up experiments of AMS. And you see it's running, it's recording cosmic rays. This is live, this is not fake, this is not a video. These are live events which are coming in and you can see muons from the cosmic rays coming in and we measure them online. And that's exactly the same way how AMS works. You see the detector elements which are on, we reconstruct the particle track, we measure mass, energy and charge. This is the task of AMS. AMS was constructed by 16 countries, 60 institutes, 600 physicists over 16, 15 years. And the cost is on the order of 2 billion dollars. Euro, Swiss francs, whatever you like. 2 billion. Um, <laughs> and, that, and that's a typical scale for a space experiment. So whatever large mission you look at, 
uh, the typical scale is two billion that you need to invest to get this. Um, this is a picture of AMS. It's five meter times four meter times three meter, so it's 60 cubic meter instrumented volume. Uh, it's 7.5 tons weight. If you compare it to, to a digital photo camera, you would say it has 300,000 pixels, which is not much compared to the megapixel cameras that we have, but we take up to 6,000 pictures per second. And we have 650 computers on board installed in AMS. The special electronics developed by us, I shouldn't tell the other folks here, but it's twi 10 times faster than what they can build. Um, <laughs> AMS consists of several subdetectors. Sorry, this was too far. Several subdetectors. The Napa one, which is called transition radiation detector. Uh, it's a quantum mechanic effect that we use for particle identification. And the upper part of AMS, this was completely constructed in ARP. Um, for you as a student, it might be surprising. We are able to build space qualified hardware. And these guys <laughs> were, uh, had enough courage to ride on the shuttle when two point, more than two point, nearly three tons of the 7.5 tons were suspended by a structure which was built in Aachen, constructed in Aachen, and delivered to NASA, uh, according to, I mean, fulfilling the NASA safety requirements, um, which I find amazing. I, as a student, would have never expected that a university, a lab in the university is doing it, which means PhD students have constructed a significant part of this instrument, tested and operated. Uh, AMS is a complex particle physics detector, as I said here, it consists of one, two, three, four, five, six sub-instruments which try to measure the mass, the charge and the energy of cosmic rays. And as I said, the upper part, this part here was completely built in Aachen, the uh, support structure for the permanent magnet was built in Aachen, so the permanent magnet alone is 2.5 tons. And this is weight optimized to the kilogram here. And if this would break, these guys wouldn't sit here. Okay. They want to convince themselves that this is working, so they came to CERN in 2010. Um, they arrived after a transatlantic flight at 7 o'clock in the morning. And the first thing they did, they went to Mont Blanc from there. Not to our meeting. They told us we start the meeting at 2 o'clock, we first go to Mont Blanc. They didn't only go up with Aiguille de Midi to 3,800 meter. But they took climbing equipment and they walked on Mont Blanc. And I think this is what you expect from astronauts. I mean, if you read book, uh, books about astronauts, this is what you expect from these guys. Um, okay, and here you see them. It's just before the shuttle launch. It happened on, on May 16th. Commander Mark Kelly, he is not here, flight pilot Gregory Johnson and the mission specialist, uh, and they had a very difficult task. They had to transfer AMS from the shuttle to the ISS, and they will show you how difficult this was. And I was, I mean, I was at Johnson Space Center, and I was amazed by this. This was an operation for five hours, extremely difficult, extremely precise, and they did an excellent job. So this is the shuttle launch, May 16th, 8 in the morning. This is AMS, the robot arm has installed it on the space station May 19th. And uh, this is one of the first events. It was installed at 5 o'clock in the morning, so they don't care about working hours as usual. 5 o'clock in the morning, so we were there since, since midnight basically watching what they were doing at Johnson Space Center. And then data taking started four hours later, which is extremely short for such a complex instrument. That is one of the first events. It's a carbon event, which we recorded, and at 10 o'clock there was a press conference at uh, Johnson Space Center where Professor Tink presented the first event, AMS is working. Now, AMS is operational, we are taking data, so this is um, longitude and latitude, and uh, this is the data rate that we have, the average data rate is 700 Hz. So we are recording cosmic rays with a frequency of 700 Hz, um, continuously. Our average efficiency is 85% for the DAQ system and uh, I'm especially proud of all of the 5,248 channels that we constructed in Aachen. All 5,248, they are fully operational. 
and the team from the institute is sitting in the first row. Um, these are the people who actually did it uh, in the institute, in the first physics institute, constructed this, and all of it is operational. Success, but we are still in the calibration phase. This is a difficult experiment. Um, the position of the instrument is so large that we have to really calibrate for each little change. For example, little change is when Atlantis docks and they rotate the ISS by 180 degrees. We see this yeah? as a large effect. You have to calibrate it and correct for it. And this will take some time, so I will not show any physics with that. But uh, the summary is rather short. AMS is operational on the ISS since May 19th, and we are recording great science data. I cannot tell you what nature has in mind for us. So somebody created this universe 14 billion years ago. So I cannot tell you what, what is in there. Yeah? But we have a thousand times better sensitivity than anybody else to find something new. So let's cross the finger and hope that we are lucky and find something interesting. Thank you for your attention. Today, uh, with this uh, little presentation. First of all, we wanted to make you very proud to be a member of this university. <laughs> and then there's going to be a little written uh, examination at the end of this presentation, uh, and we want you all to fill it in. It's going to be one credit point if you get all the answers right. With these words, I would like to hand over to the acting commander of the, of the, uh, the crew, uh, Gregory H. Box uh, Johnson, and I understand that you will introduce your crew and you will also Tell us something about the, the flight and the mission. Is that correct? Meine Damen und Herren, guten Morgen. Wir uh, sprechen bereits uh, perfekt Deutsch. <laughs> so, uh, würden wir uh, die Möglichkeit sehen, uh, ihr Englisch zu üben. <laughs> uh, so, I will now start in the English portion. Um, this is an exciting day to be here in Aachen. You have a beautiful city, a beautiful university, a wonderful country, and all these very intelligent people. And, uh, we, we felt the energy of when we walked in. It's very exciting for us, and uh, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to share uh, our adventure with you uh, we're going to start off with some slides. Uh, could we lower the lights just a little bit, please, uh, so we can see the slides? We also have a video. It's a very exciting video. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Uh, we do work in space, but on the video, we captured a lot of the fun that we had in space as well. <laughs> but here we have a very special picture. And this photograph actually was taken from the International Space Station as we were docking onto the space station on the third flight day, it was very coincidental. It was very lucky. Uh, I think it almost was fortuitous that we uh, were directly over Germany uh, when we were docking on the space station. And uh, here you can see Worms, and the north is up here. I think Aachen is uh, over in this area, right? Yeah, actually up here. <laughs> and 
And uh, you can see uh, some of our uh, sponsors, Gerhard Garm and his uh, nonprofit, as well as the, the uh, Museum Inspire, uh, are all in the photograph as we're uh, uh, boarding this. This is not Photoshop. This is an actual photo <laughs> of the space shuttle. All right. Well, I'd like to introduce our crew. <laughs> Copycats, but this is Mark Kelly. Uh, here I am. We've got Roberto Vittori, our Italian stallion. Uh, we have Greg Chumatop, who was not able to be here uh, with us today, and then uh, Mike Fink. Uh, Mike Fink is the American with the most time in space, so he, you'll hear from him as, uh, as he talks about his experiences. And then our uh, honored uh, spacewalk captain, uh, Drew Foistel, over here. So we are. Um, going to share our story chronologically through the mission from flight day one onto uh, the landing, and I'll go ahead and get going here. Uh, as you may know, uh, we were the final uh, space shuttle crew uh, of Endeavour. Endeavour flew 25 flights in her uh, history, and uh, of course this mission had the great honor of installing uh, the AMS on top of the space station, but we also uh, were the final assembly mission for the International Space Station. It took 36 shuttle missions to complete the space station, and uh, Endeavour uh, was the uh, final mission to, to complete it. Uh, after Endeavour, there was only one more shuttle. It was STS-135, uh, and they uh, completed uh, the uh, refurbishment and uh, uh, finished the supplies going up to the space station, but the actual assembly was complete on our mission. You can see us as we cruise out of the clouds. Uh, this is only about one and a half minutes after launch, and we're already going two times the speed of sound, uh, and only eight and a half minutes uh, later, we were going 28,000 kilometers per hour. Well, once we get to orbit, we immediately start to get to work, and here you can see the shuttle's uh, robotic arm. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Sorry about that. But this uh, laser pointer right here. Here's the shuttle's robotic arm, and, you, and uh, Roberto Vittori uh, was the first one to move the shuttle's robotic arm. We also have a station robotic arm, and I was the lead robotic arm operator, so uh, part of the uh, mission that we had, of course, was to install our payloads onto orbit, and you'll see that during our video. Now here's the space station as we're approaching. And can we decrease the intensity of these spotlights just a little bit so that everybody can have a, uh, see the beautiful photographs? Here you can see the uh, International Space Station through the overhead window. This is Drew and this is Mark Kelly. Ah, oh, that's much better. And here's what the International Space Station looked like uh, out our window as we approached from about a, a thousand meters. Once we attached the space station, we joined up with six other crew members that were living on the space station. They're all wearing the uh, blue shirts. And here you can see uh, another Italian, uh, Paolo Nespoli, and a Russian, uh, Dimitri, who, by the way, was a MiG-29 pilot in the uh, Russian Air Force, and I was an F-15 pilot in the U.S. Air Force. <laughs> so it was very interesting to be working together with uh, uh, a former enemy, now we're buddies. <laughs> but anyway, we floated onto the space station and uh, joined up with uh, Katie Coleman and several of the others. You'll see all of this in, in our video as we go through. But we immediately went to work. It's very interesting. When you're a shuttle crew, you join onto the space station, and it was only just a couple days after we launched. We went to work and we started installing these payloads. This was the first of our two payloads, the ELC-3, and we did a robotic handover to the space station robotic arm to attach it onto the truss. Then, the next step was to install the AMS. I thank you very much for the opportunity to share some thoughts and some experience with you. 
Um, as we are from my accent, I look the same as the other, but I am different. In fact, <laughs> In fact, my um, duty station, my hometown, is very close, it's Cologne, okay? Oh, by the way... By the way, I'm fluent in uh, German, but uh, I will not uh, embarrass my commander with this initial speech. <laughs> uh, I will continue with my English, but I will keep my accent. Uh, you saw a number of images going through the first part of the flight, from launch to space. In reality, the transition is all but uh, trivial. In fact, the, the first 8 minutes and 50 seconds are extremely dynamic. Put yourself in the orange suit um, that you saw before we were walking out. You sit on a... so you, you, you wear your scaphander, and then you climb on the shuttle. It's 270 feet high. It's beautiful from the top of the stack to see the Florida uh, surroundings and then come down, you sit on your seat and those seats are very similar to your seat where you sit now. <laughs> the only difference is that uh, you are straight up. So use your imagination, just the picture self on the launch pad, sitting on your back and uh, waiting for the countdown to go to zero. It's absolutely incredible. And then finally you do go to zero and uh, it's so fast that uh, my, my gut feeling is, uh, I, I flew three times, two times on the Soyuz is, is slightly different. On the shuttle, you do have uh, this strong sensation to be pushed from your back up to the sky. It's almost like being in a cartoon. It was so fast, it was almost unreal. But then everything changes. When you get to orbit, when you get to space, from this very dynamic phase, everything is quiet. And uh, you look around, everything's floating. That transition is very important because human bodies react differently. So, and uh, I'm focusing on it because IMS has been one of the very first tasks that we did when we reached orbit. So the real question was, uh, how do we feel? We were floating around, looking at each other, and uh, um, we were not verbalizing emotions or sensations, but uh, it was very evident that we were all going through the transition. And my task was uh, to do robotic operations up front. I had never flown on the shuttle before. I did have a microgravity experience, but uh, for me, how my body would have adapted to microgravity was an unknown. So I, I did uh, have a few talks with uh, Box and uh, I, I, I want to change the plan box as usual. And uh, being the focus on IMS, I just want to uh, underline that part. So again, follow with your imagination. After launching on the shuttle, you are finally in space. And oh, by the way, if we move the space near, this will be huge. Just uh, uh, try to uh, depict with your imagination a, a, a world where everything is floating. So you are floating around, uh, you, you, when you perceive that you're floating, trying to grab your, uh, your arm on your chair, and then you discover that you are rotating together with your chair, ladies would have uh, airs floating around, uh, and that's all, all fun, but uh, again, in a short while, you will be asked to perform a very complex uh, robotic task operation where preciseness is key. So how can you be precise if you are floating, if your body is floating, if the way you look outside is completely different from Earth. And that was, uh, that was my question when I was uh, uh, floating by box and uh, uh, in reality IMS has been a really a team effort. We all gave an important contribution, but uh, I want to pick on box just because he already broke the ice with you. So box, why don't you come over on the other side and we'll uh, reproduce what we did. Uh, I need an IMS. Uh, is this uh, good enough as a reproduction of IMS? <laughs> so I had uh, IMS in the bay, and I was on the shuttle side. Box, box, how do you feel, box? I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he would have lied, right? <laughs> I, I, I won't allow box to lie. But we were all a little bit uh, going through the transition, and this on the shuttle, on the, on the station side, and uh, he was looking at the world from the cupola. I guess later on we'll have a, 
So that's the divider. I am on the shuttle and I am inside my, my uh, cockpit with my controls and uh, I masses and is in the bay. So I reach with the robotic arm that is uh, uh, at the beginning in a, in a resting position, grab up and go down and grab it. That is the first part, but... Uh, <laughs> There is the, the other part that is easy to describe and to say, meaning take it up and give it to, to the uh, ISS robotic arm. Obviously you have questions in your mind because uh, tolerances are very, very small uh, centimeters or inches depending on which, which uh, language you use. And you know, the shuttle launch is very dynamic, so something may have shifted and you always have in mind, even during the presentation you heard, the two billion dollars and everybody's watching. So I, I, I was there floating around and uh, I was scrabble and uh, I said, well, let, let's do it. So I took it up very slowly. Oh, how many pictures? Let me, let me get the publicity for the water, maybe I can get some. Wedding, wedding and wedding, they don't go away. And here it is, we are in space. Another symbolic part of a cooperation and in space. And then I let it go. <laughs> and Box had uh, the task. Actually, it was uh, I was watching on the, on the TV. That has been very, very challenging, that part. This is uh, um, the, the, the image of IMS once it got installed to the, to the truss of the International Space Station and uh, I, I was not active part of it, of the effort at that moment, so I was enjoying and uh, this picture, uh, this image is, is, is nice, but I can assure you that if you would have the opportunity to see from space, it's absolutely breathtaking. The colors and, uh, in, in space are, are unique. Next. <laughs> Me and Box, uh, uh, we did have additional experiments, Italian experiments, and the uh, next box. Yeah, uh, you see, why, with so many nice pictures, why you take a picture that is so confusing? Because that, that was a, a very, way, a very nice way to describe the confusion that you experience in microgravity. We were starting to a little bit describe before, uh, also as a human experience, floating, everything is floating. If you, if, you want to, if you want to move from one place or the other, you just don't walk, you push yourself. The, the way I describe it, the human body uh, becomes halfway between a fish and a bird. <laughs> and uh, in this context, uh, uh, again, trying to put yourself uh, close your eyes and uh, tomorrow morning when you wake up uh, you open your drawer and uh, everything is floating inside, okay? So storage and it's one of the uh, uh, very easy tasks on Earth and becomes a challenge in space. Next box. Uh, well, in here also, uh, I like this picture because it's inside the European module ADB and uh, Germany had a very, very important contribution in uh, building um, the, the ATP. Next box. One final slide, uh, Pope the Benedict the Sixteenth. And, uh, and uh, we are here in a unique moment. Uh, our mission had the privilege to have uh, an in-flight call with, uh, with the Pope and, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, Thomas Ryder, that is uh, uh, the German astronaut and the currently director of the Human Space Flight and Operation for ESA was uh, our counterpart during the in-flight call and uh, with this I will leave the floor to uh, Drew Feustel for some very unique images of uh, EVA. Because this is where I actually got to work on the mission, and uh, the 
three of these individuals, including Mark Kelly, were able to ride on the flight deck of the space shuttle when we launched into space. They were upstairs looking out the windows, watching the Earth roll by as we accelerated to uh, 28,000 kilometers an hour. Great fast. Uh, I was downstairs in the space shuttle staring at the lockers. And, uh, <laughs> I couldn't see anything. Uh, but I was looking forward to this opportunity, which is a chance to go outside and work in space. Uh, myself, Mike Fink, and Greg Shamatoff, the three of us, spent uh, nearly 30 hours in space uh, doing spacewalks. We had four spacewalks for the mission. We've already described that uh, the AMS installation we really did not have any uh, EVA or spacewalk work that was associated with it, but we did have some contingency operations in case. Uh, there were some problems with the installation. We would then go outside and make some repairs uh, and allow the AMS to be attached. In this image, you can see uh, myself up at the top of the space station, retrieving on our first EVA an external payload being exposed to uh, the vacuum of space. And uh, my space walking partner for the day was Greg Shamatov, <coughs> hidden here in the structure of the truss. A space station, we describe it as the size of a football field. I guess it would be about the same as a soccer field or, or actual football field here as well. Um, but it's quite large, and, and in fact, in this image, we're nearly to the end of the truss segment or the supporting structure for the space station. It's quite a ways out from the middle, and it's easy to get lost out there. For every hour that we spend in space, uh, we train for roughly 10 hours on the Earth in an underwater pool. And we do that wearing our spacesuits. These spacesuits weigh roughly 150 kilograms on the Earth. But in space, of course, they're weightless. And each time we put the spacesuit on, uh, we remain in the spacesuit for nearly seven hours, uh, sometimes eight hours at a time, working. We don't have any water, or so we don't have any food, but we do take water with us. Uh, but we don't take any breaks when we work. So we train for a long time to be prepared for these missions. And uh, it's not all work out there, you can see, uh, we do have time to smile and have fun. Uh, this is a great shot of Mike uh, near the end of the mission on our last EDA performing some work. And another shot of he and I uh, on the third spacewalk, uh, both smiling because the view from space in a spaceship is very special. It's unique from the view that we have inside the space station or the space shuttle. Uh, because there's nothing that separates us from the vacuum of space except for our clear plexiglass visor. And in some places on the space station, when you look down upon the Earth, uh, oftentimes there's nothing else in sight except for the planet itself. There's no, you can't see your foot, your hand, you can't see the space shuttle, you cannot see the space station. All you see is the planet Earth in your view. And it's a very unique opportunity that, that we're afforded as spacewalkers to go out and, and see the beauty of the planet in that way. So again, we worked for four spacewalks uh, during the course of the mission, and uh, in total it was nearly 30 hours of effort uh, to be outside. Finally, when our work was done after the fourth spacewalk, uh, Mike Fink and Greg Shamatov performed that last, that last EVA, and with their work and the, and the final tasks that they performed, we completed the assembly of the space station. So the space station has been orbiting the planet since the year 2000. We've had humans on board. And at this time, with our mission, with our final spacewalk, and the work that uh, Mike and Greg did on that day, they achieved assembly complete of the space station, and we were proud to have had that opportunity and uh, a chance to be out in space to, uh, to witness it all. And in this image, uh, which uh, I believe Mike captured with the camera, we see the space shuttle docked with the space station all the way to the end of the ATV and the truss structure which supports our solar arrays across the middle uh, to capture that historical moment where we completed the work in space uh, and will hopefully allow the space station to uh, remain in orbit and continue its work uh, for the next uh, 10 to 15 years. Thank you.
And uh, we uh, could hardly imagine that some of us would be uh, distinguished professors uh, building uh, space hardware and opening up the secrets of the universe, or to be spacewalkers, or to be a, Italian uh, test pilots. <laughs> to open up space for more and more people. So some of you will have a chance to be in space and see what we have seen. Uh, I guarantee it. It will be very exciting. So if you ever get a chance to go into orbit, take this chance. <laughs> you've heard about all this exciting, uh, 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 the excitement of space travel to uh, sit there and uh, go into orbit traveling 28,000 kilometers per hour, to go on the excitement of a spacewalk, or to uh, perform these delicate and yet important uh, uh, robotic operations. Yeah, that's uh, all the exciting stuff. I get to tell you about the less exciting stuff, like how to uh, take apart a, uh, uh, a carbon dioxide removal system. I mean, they made, uh, we were technicians, uh, and, uh, and it was very fun and exciting also. Uh, because, uh, because I had been aboard already the space station one year previously, uh, my, uh, they asked myself, along with the space station crew member Ron Guerin, to take this apart. Uh, I think it's equivalent to an uh, engine or maybe a BMW. Uh, you will see it's a lot of, uh, it was a lot of work. We had to take it completely apart and put it back together with uh, no parts left behind. <laughs> so myself and uh, Dr. Shamatov uh, at, uh, took this, uh, you know, he has a PhD, a very smart guy, but uh, we turned some wrenches and uh, took apart uh, the carbon dioxide removal system and uh, put a new, uh, a new part to, uh, on it. But also we stopped to take a look outside. This is what we can see. We have the planet Earth down below and the whole universe out in front of us. I'm not sure why we were fighting and uh, having a lot of uh, arguments down here when we have all of here up to, to explore. And here at the university, uh, every day you are exploring something new. And uh, so I congratulate you for not fighting, but to explore. And this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, is a unique photo because Actually, this is the International Space Station, many photos of that, but the space station with the uh, space shuttle attached uh, is, uh, is uh, very rare. And our friend uh, Paolo Nespoli, when he left off the Russian, uh, with the Russian Soyuz, uh, undocked, and they uh, made a special effort to take uh, this photo. But you can see this is uh, what we have built as human beings from planet Earth, the largest space structure ever all the way from the automated transfer vehicle built in Bremen, uh, through the uh, modules built in Russia, America, Italy, uh, and uh, Japan. I mean, this is what, uh, along with our Canadian uh, space arms, uh, robot arms, this is what we do together as human beings. It is absolutely amazing. So we started to come back home. We started the mission with us launching. Now we'll talk a little bit about landing, and then we'll show our video. Uh, we actually uh, were thinking to the future with the last flight of Endeavour. We uh, had a special uh, undocking and then we uh, normally would leave the space station and go back home. In this case, we came back to the space station to about 300 meters for re, uh, re-docking and re-rendezvous uh, along the way with this uh, uh, pro uh, program called STORM. Uh, I just would like to point this out. This is. Uh, one of the best, this is the results from one of the best pilots of the United States of America, that's a Box Johnson as he flew around the space station. Uh, he never talks about how well he can fly, but he's one of our, the best pilots, which is why he's a pilot of Endeavour. So we rendezvous with the space station. in the morning uh, we, uh, we landed back in Florida and uh, uh, Roberto always has a, a very great story about how it comes back because we are starting at 28,000 kilometers per hour and an hour later we are at zero kilometers per hour after we uh, stop and uh, during that time we used the, 
atmosphere of planet Earth to slow us down, which generates a lot of heat. Uh, we saw it as a pink glow inside the cockpit. It was uh, indescribable, the color, and, uh, and uh, Roberto, of course, mentioned when we were at the peak heating time. Uh, just because it was, uh, it was all, it was extremely hot outside, but inside the space shuttle was uh, nice and cool. <laughs> and uh, there's Mark Kelly's uh, landing, a beautiful soft landing. Uh, Roberto and myself, who have flown with the Russians on the Soyuz, can tell you about the, the landings that are not soft. <laughs> we both enjoyed, we all enjoyed our smooth landing. And uh, we'd like to, again, say thank you very much for your warm welcome. We did our best with this uh, piece of space hardware, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, with uh, so many important parts built right here. Uh, congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. And to you students, remember, this, the future is yours. And the more you study, and uh, the harder you work, the more adventure you will have. And every day is an adventure. So good luck to you all. So anyway, we, we, we went a little over, and we don't have a lot of time for questions, uh, but we'd like to entertain uh, questions uh, at this time. Uh, we can lower the house lights maybe just a little bit, or bring them up, yeah, bring them up, that's right. These spotlights are always fun. Who, who do we have? Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for this wonderful and inspiring uh, presentation. Thank you. And uh, as you can see, you are also very really young fans. And so my question is, I learned that you are uh, Air Force pilot, test pilots, and so on. Um, how did you come to this profession? Was it always a dream to, uh, to go to space? Well, for me, when I was seven years old, uh, I watched Neil Armstrong step on the moon. That was my first spark. Uh, so that kind of dates me, because I was seven years old in 1969. That's a hard one to follow by. So. <laughs> I think we all, from an early age, had this dream of, uh, of going to space. I know I did. I think Mike shares that, and so, so did Roberto. And when we listened to each other's stories, we were all interested in space flight and, and I think from an early age the imagination and that's what we try to uh, motivate others to think about that there's, there's, I like to say there's a lot of space in space. <laughs> because there is and many of us, many people on the planet go throughout the day driving their cars to work just focusing on the things that are in front of them, not really looking any higher in the sky than the road sign, the exit sign for, for the exit to work and back home. And so I, we like to encourage people from an early age to think about all the expanse of space and the amazing possibilities that are out there. It really is endless. It's infinite. And uh, hopefully with missions uh, like ours with AMS in space and uh, the secrets we see of the universe with the Chandra X-ray Observatory and the Hubble Space Telescopes and some of the ground-based telescopes, uh, we're learning more and more about that universe. And we'd encourage kids from an early age to, and, and parents as well, to, to get young people to think about all the opportunities and the fact that space really is our future. I got a question to Mr. Feusel. Uh, when you work outside in that suit and you have that clumsy fingers, how do you, how do you ensure you don't lose any screws or parts and they're flying away? That's a, that's a good question. I'm going to say that in our mission, neither myself, Mike Fink, or Greg Shamatoff lost anything. And that's, you know, there's, there's three major objectives when you go out in space on a spacewalk. One is um, don't lose anything. <laughs> the second is uh, don't break anything. <laughs> and the third is don't make any mistakes. So we had a very successful uh, space mission. And the reason we're able to maintain a uh, grasp of those uh, tools and not lose anything is because of the training. As I mentioned, we spend roughly 10 hours in the water uh, at the Johnson Space Center training underwater in our spacesuits to simulate space. 10 hours for every one hour that we spend in space. 
So we trained for over 250 hours in the pool before we even went outside to work on the, uh, on the space station. So that sort of training builds in muscle memory and uh, common principles of work that we try to repeat over and over and over and over again. Every single task that we perform in space on a spacewalk, we've practiced before. Every move we make with our hand, every position we put the tool in, every place we store something, that has been practiced over and over and over again and that allows us to perform those without a doubt here. Have you guys ever experienced a situation with, uh, where um, an emergency where you would think this is really, really bad. Oh, something's going to be, something's going to explode or something like that. Yeah, the question was about, uh, you know, the uh, emergency. And of course, if you watch the movie, every five minutes there's some kind of uh, emergency or something to help with the drama. In, uh, in the real space, we like to have a very boring movie. And uh, so, it's very rare when we have emergency. Uh, as uh, my friend uh, Dr. Foisto mentioned, uh, we uh, train a lot, including training in the cockpit of the space shuttle, and we have a lot of simulated emergencies. In fact, on some of the times they throw about 12 or 14 uh, malfunctions in a row, and uh, each and every time we have to uh, solve the problems. And, uh, so that part was fun. We do that so that on the real flight, there are no emergencies. However, during uh, one of my uh, spacewalks, my very first one, I was in the Russian spacesuit, and uh, we went outside, and uh, I had some kind of uh, oxygen leak. And uh, my uh, oxygen gauge, which told me how much oxygen I had, it's like the petrol you have in your car. You know it moves, but you never watch it move. If, uh, you, you know, at the end of the week, maybe end of two weeks, it's at the empty sign, but you, don't, you never see it move. So this, but the oxygen, my oxygen gauge was moving, and, and I have to confess I am addicted uh, to breathing, and uh, so I had to uh, go back inside uh, quickly. But I didn't feel uh, nervous or afraid or anything because this is uh, just another, to me, what I know it was for real, but it was like the simulation. You know, we knew exactly what to do. Uh, I started to go back inside of the space station. Uh, my Russian colleague said, hey, Misha, you better go back inside. I said, okay, that's a good idea. <laughs> and we went back inside, you know, and then it was, uh, it was not a problem. But uh, these emergencies, we do not like to see them in space, and uh, we have very excellent training on how to handle them. So, uh, you know, maybe uh, I should have had, had a little more drama and waited till the just came in here, had just enough energy, just enough oxygen until we closed the door like you would see on the movies, but uh, in real life we, we don't have that kind of thing. Thank goodness. Um, first of all, I want to thank you uh, all for your emotional view on the mission. Um, yeah, applause. <laughs> Um, and the next thing is a technical question um, on your protection for the space suit. Do you have uh, two different protections for the, the reflectors on your helmet? One for outside and one for the inside? It's uh, really the, so the, the question about the visor, what type on the space suit when we're outside. There's a clear visor uh, that we use when we're not in the sun, and there's a gold plate visor that we use when we are in the sun. Um, it's very important to have the gold visor down when the sun shines, because otherwise the sun can be blinding. Um, it's, it's like staring at the sun from the earth, only you're uh, outside of the atmosphere and, and uh, 500 kilometers closer, so it's even brighter. Uh, and I can tell you that I had an experience in space on my first mission where I uh, didn't have an opportunity to close my visor because I was busy working and both hands were occupied and I had no assistance at the time and the sun came out and reflection was just right that it was directly in my eyes and I had no way to close my visor. So then I closed my eyes. Now if you're an astronaut in space with both hands full and your eyes are closed, it's not a very comfortable situation. <laughs> 
Uh, but fortunately, uh, the Earth uh, orbits around the Sun, and it also spins on its axis, and of course the space station orbits around the Earth. So in time, the angle changes and the Sun goes away, but it's very important that we have that gold visor uh, down, and we always bring it down whenever the Sun rises, comes up on the horizon, otherwise it becomes very difficult. It's a manual, yeah, we reach up uh, with our arms and, and rotate it down from the side of our helmet. Yeah, uh, thanks again for me too. Um, my question is, uh, do you guys have all mili the military training and if so, how important is it to have uh, that, to become an astronaut? The question for the exceptions. Uh, you're asking whether we all have a military training, right? Um, Drew doesn't have it, but uh, <laughs> but it was the most military of the entire crew. <laughs> now in our crew we were six, and uh, four were coming from military background, air force or navy, and the two were uh, scientists engineers. You don't like the answer, you want to change the... <laughs> Let, let's do 50-50. So tell me... Bob, Bob, Bob's not be an engineer, right? <laughs> you, can, you can become an astronaut even if you don't have military training. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, no, in fact, in fact, in the... I, I'm not sure what is the percentage in the population of NASA astronauts, but... Uh, I believe it 50-50, yeah. 50-50, medical doctors, engineers, there are many engineers, scientists. Yeah, no, it, it, absolutely not something that is exclusively for, for military people. It's quite the opposite. The International Space Station is laboratory. So in reality, to have scientists or engineers is uh, extremely important. And, uh, and I just wanted to add one thing. My, I have a three-year-old daughter at home and she reminds me of this every day, is that uh, it's not just boys who can be astronauts, <laughs> girls can be astronauts too, so don't forget that. Uh,
Okay. I, I'm not sure exactly how you experience the moon. I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. Ich bin ein Schultz. The uh, looking at the, the stars and the moon uh, from the space station, uh, although we don't have the atmosphere to look through, uh, it, it's very much like uh, uh, looking at the, the moon and the stars uh, from the Earth. Uh, we have lighting on the space station that c can in interfere with our views, and so if we turn the lights way down and look out the beautiful windows uh, of the cupola or of, of the space station uh, parts or the space shuttle, we can see uh, uh, the moon, for example, uh, in, a, in a little bit different perspective. But if you have a full moon here at Earth, you have a full moon uh, on the space station as you orbit around the Earth. Next. Well, <laughs> I, I need to go back to Cologne and ask my hierarchical chain. I, I currently, we are finishing, I guess, this opportunity is most likely uh, one last opportunity for us to, to share some experience on, my, on our STS-134. And uh, for me, personally, I need to wait and see the decisions of the European Space Agency. Options for astronauts, for me as European astronauts, either Houston or Star City in case of a training uh, to a space flight or Cologne or in the Netherlands we have Aztec. Um, it's, it's pretty exciting and uh, my, my hope is that uh, in the near future there will be uh, more precise ideas of what will be the next challenging project the International Space Station that you have seen in those images is a, a beautiful piece of technology, but it's, it's today. We, we need to think about the future, and uh, most likely it will be your future. Two more questions. Two more questions. Okay, um, did you guys ever um, have any experience with um, claustrophobia on the International Space Station? Uh, claustrophobia, no. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the tests that they have for uh, for astronauts is to make sure we are not uh, claustrophobia, uh, claustrophobic, because uh, uh, both myself and Alberto, we flew uh, twice uh, with the Russians and the Soyuz. The Soyuz is very, very compact. Um, it's like uh, putting three people, three big people, into a smart car. And, uh, <laughs> There's not very much room, and if you were claustrophobic, then uh, it would not be a fun mission. But uh, I can tell you that we all had fun, and we do not uh, feel this uh, claustrophobia. And if you have it, get rid of it, because there's uh, too many things to see. <laughs> My question is, how did you guys actually enter NASA, especially for us, most of us are engineers or scientists, how is it possible to, to get into NASA, especially to get into such projects? Do we need to apply or do we need to kind of wait for, uh, wait for NASA to ask us? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is, there's a couple of ways to get involved with NASA. Are you referring to as astronauts or just with space research and science? So, you know, I have, let me talk about the others. So, to get into space research and science, you already know there's projects that go on within universities that researchers can get involved with as scientists uh, to integrate with the NASA programs. Many scientists who are integrated with those programs, some have become astronauts because that allows them some access into the program. Uh, NASA, NASA itself, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in the United States, only hires U.S. citizens as astronauts. However, uh, ESA, and I can't speak 
to that fully, but uh, obviously has opportunities for international partners. Germany is, is one of them. So uh, people who are in, interested in becoming astronauts uh, pursue advanced degrees typically and then uh, look for opportunities within their country or their uh, unified organization that represents the human spaceflight program and, and find opportunities to apply to those programs. NASA selects astronauts every two to five years and uh, when that process uh, is available, uh, individuals fill out an application. If you're a civilian like myself, a civilian scientist, you fill out many, 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 many pages of paperwork uh, to apply to the program and then you wait. And you wait for the opportunity for an interview and then uh, hopefully eventually selection. With the military, it's slightly different. These individuals, I believe, are promoted by their organizations uh, to be available at, for selection and then from those select individuals, NASA uh, picks, as Roberto said, roughly 50% civilians and 50% uh, military astronauts. Okay, that's it.